Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Crawford Brief, where we focus on informed analysis and timely insights in the field of urology. Joining me to discuss an important breakthrough in the management of advanced prostate cancer is Dr. Maha Hussein. Maha is a colleague and good friend who is a professor of medicine and deputy director of the Robert H. Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Center at Northwestern University in Chicago. She has worked with me over the years in the Southwest Oncology Group, has done a lot of great things. We're going to focus on, on that, right, one of those areas right now. In addition, she is an internationally recognized expert in genital urinary oncology. Her, her uh, research focuses not only on prostate, but also bladder cancer. So, Mahan, recently we published the results of the uh, Aeronote trial. You're familiar with the Aerosense trial, which uh, involved uh, chemotherapy with darolutamide. And now, this, in, this one is a study of a doublet therapy of uh, therolutamide and ADT versus ADT and the placebo. You published a number of years ago a, a sort of a landmark study of Nader PSAs. And what I'm showing right now on my screen is a summary of an abstracts we are putting together uh, for submission and have actually submitted them to a number of medical meetings. But what was seen in that, that, um, that Arano trial with over 600 patients using sort of your criteria as a Nader PSA of undetectable or less than 0.2, depending on how you manage it, a, a significant difference between the treatment arm which was darolutamide and ADT versus ADT and the placebo, 86 versus 43%, and breakdown by PSA levels where it was more significant. And we also saw the, the usual things, time the radiographic progression. So I was wondering if, if you would mind sharing with us and welcome some of your thoughts. This... Uh, your pivotal publication and the implications uh, to what we're seeing here in this Aeronote trial. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for the opportunity. So I think one of the issues, which is really why the PSA factor played role, if you recall, in the older days, we had primarily bone scan and assessing response and benefit with a bone scan is a bit difficult uh, by itself. Mm -hmm. Obviously, CAT scans were available. If you had measurable disease, you can assess it. One of the nice things, if you have a biomarker, and in oncology, as you know, for example, germ cell tumors, we have biomarkers, you know, uh, other colon cancer, we have some biomarkers. So in prostate cancer, uh, the older days was acid phosphatase, but then we got PSA. And PSA is a much more I want to say sensitive and biomarker that we have been using. And so when we did the intermittent trial and you collaborated, obviously you chaired the committee and you approved the analyses and so on. When we looked at uh, could PSA response or progression be a flag as to how a patient is responding. And so we looked at essentially the Nader PSA. So the Nader would be if it was le undetectable, um, less than 0.2 or less than four, but uh, not undetectable. And, um, and of course, if uh, more than four, it declined, but more than four still. And what was clear is this, is that the median survival practically almost close to doubled when you're comparing the undetectable to patients who have not achieved an undetectable level and the patients who did the worst, actually, from a prognostic perspective, were those patients who uh, their PSA might have gone down, but it stayed above four. And so it is a flag. Now, one thing I would say, and I'm seeing this is a little bit more in my practice, which is there are times where we see the PSA goes down, but there may be other things going on where there is some other reason to suspect the patient may be progressing. So I would say from my practice, I don't just stick with PSA. I do the PSA and I also verify with periodic imaging. And just to raise awareness, we've recently are being seeing cases of transformation to neuroendocrine small cell 
And mm-hmm. so don't go just by PSA. You know, again, this is like an outlier situation, but I do think it's going to be critical to be mindful of, you know, double checking on the response. Well, you know, I, you brought up a, the, a lot of people don't remember that the first tumor marker in oncology, actually in oncology was acid phosphatase. Acid phosphatase, exactly. 1939 by Gutman. Yes. And I think PSA is probably still one of the most significant markers in, yes. in prostate. Yes. You know, it's an inexpensive test, but the FDA, yes. as you well know, doesn't rely a lot on PSA in trials like this. But your your trial was pivotal. I mean, it, it is a great endpoint. And I guess it brings up a lot of questions. In prostate cancer, in a lot of cancers, we treat for six, nine months and then we quit. In prostate, we continue, continue. And that sort of led to the intermittent therapy. And we won't get into that right now. But what do you think? Um, is if, if, if you do have that nadir, maybe you don't have to continue with, per, particularly in, in more minimal disease. Well, I think we have to test the concept. And I would say, remembering one thing, a PSA is a function of two factors. One of them is how many cells there are in the body that have a PSA, but the other part is production by the cell. So just because the PSA goes down, it does not mean the cell is dead. And I do think that um, the concept of intermittent therapy or uh, historically when we did it was all driven by biology to allow us to, to keep the cells addicted to androgens. And obviously in the older days, based on the agents we have, it did not deliver with regard to improving outcome. I do think we've come a long way. And the question comes up, I guess sometimes now I call it treatment holiday. Is there room for treatment holiday? And if that's the case, at what time point? And I don't really feel like a few months is enough. I would think that there should be a little bit more time given. And just for the audience, there is an, uh, an alliance, I believe, clinical trial called A Dream, where uh, the treatment was for two years. The trial complete accrual. We're waiting for the results, which will take probably a little bit of time before we can get the results. Well, I think when you have effective treatments like this, uh, there are a lot of options that exist. Yes. And clearly, a Nader PSA or not supporting stopping therapy, but I think that it does need to be considered. I, we're seeing it, it, uh, it, it, as you well know, drug development in prostate cancer always started at the worst with the worst patient. Yes. Um, and castrate resistant, and then it was castrate resistant after taxotere. It's moved forward all the way to biochemical failure and even adjuvant therapies. Yes. And a lot of studies uh, show a, a lesser amount of, of therapy in time. The last cup question I want to ask you, what happens if you're one of those unfortunate patients that fails to nadir your PSA? Is that a time to stop therapy or change therapy or whatever? I know we would talk about that in SWOG for a long time about doing studies in that arena. Yeah. You know, I have to say I've been fortunate enough that pretty much my patients with uh, either doublet or triplet, they nadir to almost undetectable. Now, there are times where they are, they nadering below four, but they're not undetectable. I will tend to reevaluate them. And there are times when we haven't, like when I am not sure whether this patient should get triplet, we start with doublet and reassess after two to three months and see how things are. And then again, if the PSA sort of doesn't go to undetectable and it kind of still hovers around, this is where another conversation about adding docetaxel. And I, generally speaking, I would say with docetaxel, you don't have to give it up front. You can give it, you know, two, three months because when the trials were designed, we allowed a window there. I generally would not do it past four months or five months, um, wouldn't mm-hmm. add. But that's the situation where you have to keep watching patients. Now that we have, as I said, the stronger AR inhibitors, I've I feel like we've come a long way in terms of uh, uh, managing these patients, but there's always going to be the outlier. And I think you have to be very careful, reassess them and decide whether you should switch the AR inhibitor, maybe add steroids or something, or if the patient's still within a window of potentially considering chemotherapy uh, as part of a triplet. Well, I think that's a a really important point. Somebody may start on double therapy like this and and not nadir their PSA, it certainly is an option uh, to add chemotherapy at that point. Uh, and another factor would be, uh, David, is consideration for, um, let's say somebody with low volume disease. 
and um, not somebody that you would think, uh, you know, you give a triplet is going to be safe. And then uh, they have low volume and whether they're de novo or um, metachronous, and then you evaluate them and their PSA is not nadering. This is also, as you know, we're now uh, including targeted radiation to the sites of metastases if feasible. And that can also help. And clearly for patients with low volume, I would say local treatment for the prostate is going to be important from a radiation, uh, with radiation. Uh We could go on talking about this for a half an hour. I mean, we talk about it. We can talk about germline testing. We should do all that. Uh, When you kick in with a PARP inhibitor and so forth and so on. But let's do that another time. Sure. Maha, thanks again. I know you're a very busy person and uh, we, we respect your time and thank you for coming and sharing with us when, on this Crawford Brief, this, the, your PSA data, which uh, has been around for a while and it still is a pivotal thing that we uh, use to make decisions. Thank you so much, David. And it's always my pleasure and honor to join. And thank you for including me. Thank you.